Ladies and gentlemen, today the men and women of NORAD and U.S. North Palm in the Department of State, in keeping with one of the finest traditions, pay special tribute to Senior Foreign Service Counselor Jack Dowdrick on the occasion of his retirement after 24 years of honorable service to our country. The host for today's ceremony is Major General Connie Jenkins, United States Air Force. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> please rise for the arrival of the official party. Now we will have the national anthem. Please remain standing for the invocation. Thank you. We all join me in prayer. God, we just want to start by honoring your presence here with us today. We're gathered here to honor Jack's service to his country and to all. In the words of scripture, well done, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been seeking grace all along this journey. Your promise, God, is that I will guide you continually. And you have fulfilled this promise in his career, in the lives that he has touched, in the problem solving he's engaged in, and in the devotion he has exemplified. We are grateful for the ways in which you've kept him safe during this time of service, and when it was most difficult that you provided answers and ways to move forward. We lift up in prayer and gratitude Jack's family for their devotion, their service, their courage. It's Jack's career that brings us to this moment, but it's their collective sacrifices that have been foundational to his success and his impact for good around the world. It is God who has girded you with strength and made your way perfect, Jack. And this will most certainly be the case for you and yours as you continue on into your next adventure and your next calling. Amen. 
Thank you, Bobby Lewis, for your inspirational words. That was truly excellent. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. At this time, I would like to introduce our guest of honor. Please hold your applause until all have been recognized. Mr. Dautrick's wife, Mrs. Lori Leal Dautrick, their children, Santiago Ruben Dautrick, and me, Cadet Colonel Soliana Dautrick. <laughs> His mother, Barbara Ann Weeks, who is joining vir virtually. His father-in-law, Senor Ruben Leal Valdez, and his wife, Senora Amalia Serpa Quiros. His mother-in-law, Miss Jeanette Livingston. His sister, his sister, Miss Gannon Weeks, and her husband, Zachary Most. His brother, Mr. Hunter Weeks, and his wife, Sarah Hall, and their daughter, and their daughters, Goldie and Maisie. His brother-in-law, Mr. Robin Leo and his cousins, Holly and Jonathan Radin. We also welcome general and flag officers and senior leaders. U.S. Northern Command Deputy Commander Thomas Cardin III, Rear Admiral Scott Robertson and Mrs. Kelly Robertson, Major General Robert Magoo Davis and Mrs. Kathy Davis, Elizabeth and Sam Walker, Rob and Susan Cuniff, David Katz, Senior Foreign Service, retired, Ilya Levin, Senior Foreign Service, retired. Tina Street, former Chief of Staff of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, and Edgar Lewin, former U.S. Army. We are honored to have so many esteemed family members and guests here for today's ceremony. We welcome all of the senior leaders, esteemed colleagues, friends, and family. Thank you for attending. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to introduce Major General Connie Jenkins. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. So typically, I start these ceremonies, the last several I've done with the, what a beautiful day in Colorado, but I can't say that today. I don't know what happened, but God decided the fires needed some assistance, I guess. Um, so first, I just want to, for the crowd that um, may, not, may not be aware, the reason we do two national anthems. Um, NORAD is a binational command. It's the only one in the world. We cooperate and collaborate with Canada. The Canadian and US Armed Forces do Western Hemisphere defense. And as such, we honor both countries when we do events. It's very important to us to recognize that. And so that's, that's, that's why we do that. Uh, Chaplain Lewis, thanks so much for your words. Very nicely done. I know you have a great connection to uh, Jack and the family. So thanks for coming today. Um, really, really wonderful as we, as we honor the career and lifetime work of an incredible man and celebrate his transition to, to his next life. Um, first, I know how much, what it means to Jack to have so many people here. Jack doesn't show a lot of emotion, except for maybe some sarcasm once in a while, but he's got some, a little giddy happy going on because y'all are here today. So thank you so much for going out of your way to come. See, there it is. So, I'm, so just so you know, I'm a little irreverent, and I think this is a celebration, and I think that that's what we should be doing is celebrating. So you know, you can laugh and joke and have a good time. Uh, General Cardin, thanks for coming over. I know you're super busy, and the team for being here. So Lori, Saul, Santiago, what a great day for the family. Um, this is a family effort in the Department of State, and as I, when I do these types of events, I always ask for the background, and, and Jack would feed me tidbits at a time, because that's the way the Department of State operates. <laughs> and I'm just joking, kind of. So, so when, when I got kind of the whole picture, I was really impressed with uh, all of the variety of things that Jack and the family have done. And uh, Mrs. Weeks, thanks for joining us virtually. It's unfortunate you couldn't be here, but who knew so many years ago that we would have this virtual op option for attendance at an event like this. Typically, we would have just missed it, right? So we're super excited to have virtual viewing. So many family members here present. Thanks for coming. Should I call him out? So Jack's brother arriving now. <laughs> See, I'll pay for that later, won't I? <laughs> um, and, and honored guests from Jack's storied career at the, at the State Department, either present physically or joining us virtually. Thanks again so much for joining us today and taking time out of your schedule. In addition, all the partners across the interagency, the Department of Defense, Department of State, um, US and Canada, warmest welcome. I'm honored and humbled to be asked to do something like this. Jack and I, I think, are, fr are friends, and I appreciate his, his advice. Uh, his sage advice and wisdom are critical to the success of our mission in NORAD and US NORTHCOM. 
and as such, it's only fitting that we celebrate his retirement together in support of all of his efforts for Homeland Defense and Homeland Security writ large. Uh, Homeland Defense is a team sport, and I'm super excited to call Jack my teammate. Jack really is a team player. He has a deep love of nation, dedicated to serving a cause bigger than himself. His selflessness is a trait that many in this nation should probably emulate. As such, he's made great strides everywhere he's been assigned to protect and promote U.S. security, prosperity, and democratic values. He has truly been instrumental in shaping the international environment in which all Americans can thrive. Jack's had a long and distinguished career, a great American. Let's talk about Jack a little bit. He loves this. So n there was no peek ahead, so he has no idea what I'm going to talk about. I'm a little nervous now. <laughs> it, I think it's fun. It's fun for me. So Jack met Lori at college uh, while, while at a study abroad program in Argentina. And falling in love there and getting engaged there, and they've had a long, um, healthy, tight relationship ever since then. Lori and Jack lived and worked in, work, worked in Argentina after graduate, after graduate school, and then they both found their way to the Department of State and commenced the journey we're celebrating today. So it's a team event. Jack working at the Department of State is one thing, but Lori also worked at the Department of State for 12 years at di five different embassies, um, working in, in community coordination, and that's admirable as well, so thanks for doing that. So Jack's had 10 postings with the State Department, all with significant impact on his world and ours. So as a military guy, I think everything's an operation. So you'll have to bear with me, State Department folks, because I'm going to put a slant on some of this. So Jack ran his first operation, well, that's what we call it, during his first assignment in Eritrea. He utilized his excellent communication skills, tenacity, and his calm but friendly but resolute demeanor to assist an American who was in critical need of a medevac. He managed to get all the pieces of that puzzle to come together in under 20 hours to get the patient to a place with the medical care they needed. Jack had an opportunity then to work for Amb Ambassador Negroponte in Iraq in 2004-2005, when that region was fraught with nerves and out of balance. I know personally how hard that had to be because I was there in 06. So that, that region, as many can attest to, has uh, some challenges. It, but that, that deployment for me was my first real example of the tight connection between the Department of Defense and the Department of State and how important that connection is. Jack then moved to Jordan, followed by Uruguay. Once again, Jack was lauded by his leadership while in Uruguay for his mission focus, energy, and operational acumen. He worked tirelessly on setting the foundation for a bilateral trade agreement, reflecting, if you will, that perhaps trade is the most tangible and easily understandable way to demonstrate to ordinary folks the value of partnership with the US. He was instrumental in a bilateral memo of understanding on renewable energy and energy efficiency, energy security being critical to international peace and is high on the US uh, agenda for Americas. This memo was signed while he was on station. He also broadened the relationship between the US and the Uruguayan Antarctic Institute, which is some residual bleeding over into the NORAD NORTHCOM mission today, creating an unprecedented invitation from Uruguay to open its Antarctic base to US scientists and researchers. This foundational work created opportunities for U.S. scientists for many years following. After all of that fun, it was time for Jack to go to the mothership, back to the national capital region, to work as the senior desk officer for Israel and Palestinian affairs. Once again, Jack's superb work, re work resulted in senior leadership laudatories. He was recognized for his bilateral and multilateral diplomacy efforts, guiding U.S. policy response during critical times and activities. He did this by mastering often arcane procedural rules, the unique political international organization dynamics, and legal issues to develop and re represent Near Eastern Affairs Bureau views in internal deliberations. His ability to shape US policy was a direct result of his deep understanding of the nuance and detail necessary to advance US objectives. From DC, he went to Tunis, which is where things got a bit sporty, maybe again. His devotion to duty and flawless execution of emergency plans led to a superior honor, honor award. The embassy was evacuated due to a local violent mob uprising. The team was innovative and focused as they moved through the process. The innovation came when they used social media and televised media outlets in order to stay apprised of the situation outside the gates. In this very dangerous environment, they also used internal video conferencing equipment to show AFRICOM real time what was happening from their perspective 
as they set up the rescue efforts in order to evacuate him and the families. Material loss included 115 vehicles and many dollars of damage and destruction across the compound. The danger was clear as the embassy employees were all safely evacuated. Jack's intestinal fortitude and dedication to the mission and the people is clear. And he demonstrated that over and over again, that just being one example. He then went to his next duty assignment to Mexico. I would imagine that felt a little bit like coming home for the family. Uh, Lori and the kids being close to family, being able to uh, enjoy the weather, enjoying a great assignment after the last one, family, food, fun, sunshine that Mexico provides. But, you know, after playing in the sun in Mexico, it was time to go to Nicaragua, which was also a little bit sporty. He ended up being another sporty assignment where the family departed the mission due to civil unrest. Jack and the family experienced three different opportunities for unplanned departures. And we in the military talk a lot about the danger of being a DOD person and what it means and what it looks like to us and our families. But you cannot discount the danger on the other side of that aisle with our Department of State families and our Department of State workers. And that's why I think this connection between DOD and DOS is so incredibly important. So I guess you could count four if you, if you count COVID, maybe four unplanned departures. Um, I would argue that the impact of those years, activities, and action created the capable, resilient, versatile family that you see in front of you today. People bond through adversity, and this family is so very well connected with so much love in their hearts for each other. Jack continued to show his exemplary leadership and diplomacy skills when he was in Abu Dhabi. At that point, Jack had many years of honing his communication skills to be able to be the catalyst that brought together whole of mission perspectives. His time in that mission was complicated as he navigated a series of unprecedented challenges to include hostilities with Iran, the UAE withdrawal from Yemen, the deteriorating situation in Libya, and the COVID-19 pandemic responses. Jack was key in assisting Ambassador Ricolta, who commented, quote, Jack's counsel and demonstrated expertise were invaluable as we developed a strategic dialogue to cut through tactical distractions and focus on strengthening the bilateral relationship. And we all know how easy it is to get focused on tactical distractions. Having someone who can bring that together is really, really important. You gotta have those people in the room. You can't have all tacticians. He was lauded again for his intellectual honesty and sound reasoning. He also demonstrated courage and commitment under pressure during a classified mishap on that assignment with 890 personnel while the charge Affair was out of the country. So he led the efforts to help with that classified mishap. Jack led the analysis and reporting connecting the dots in that region, reflecting the strengthening of a relationship of interest. The response on that topic was flagged by bureau officials as a quote, model response. As someone who always innately understood the need for cooperation and collaboration, he enhanced and improved the relationship between the DOS and DOD everywhere he went. And in that location, it resulted in a $23 billion letter of acceptance for the sale of defense platforms. The increased demand signal at that time created a heavy lift for Jack and his team. They came through brilliantly, producing insightful preparatory materials for key leaders involved in many, many diplomatic engagements. Jack chaired a committee on the implementation of the Abraham Accords, a groundbreaking agreement between the UAE and Israel. I would say at this point, Jack's kind of a big deal. <laughs> his final mission assignment brought him to us, doing no small part, I'm sure, to his excellent rapport with the DOD and maybe the fact that he wanted to come to Colorado. I don't know. This is a cool place. Jack's an expert at educating the DOD and interagency partners and the audience writ large on the connective tissue between diplomatic and international activities on the part of our adversaries and why we should care. From my perspective, Jack Dotrick has turned into someone the world should admire and emulate. He clearly loves his kids, constantly talking about Saul and Santiago, about how great they are and how proud he is of their accomplishments. He's a great husband. He speaks very highly of Lori. He's never said anything negative about you in front of me. And, <laughs> and I've been around a lot of spouses that maybe not like that. So, you know, and his love and, and his love and uh, admiration for you is very clear and he really appreciates your love and support of, of him and the kids. Jack is a great thinker, reader, analyst, leader, diplomat, and just good old all-around human being. 
So what's in store now? Well, you have a wonderful, loving family you can spend time with without fear of moving again, so that's a plus. Or having to depart early, that's a huge plus. Time for lots of outdoor activities. You can watch the elk off your deck. I'm looking forward to some of that myself. Enjoying some time with Lori, the kids, friends, and extended family. So finally, I'd like to just say congratulations to Jack and Lori on a chapter of life well lived, truly leaving the type of legacy with global impact that we all strive for. So many lives you have touched in the United States and worldwide, carrying a message of the importance of freedom and democracy across the globe. Congratulations again on a very successful and impactful career. You and Lori deserve nothing less than the very best, and thank you for the honor of being here today to honor you. Jack Dowtrick will also receive the Expanding Universe Career Commemoration Award. The Expanding Universe Department of State Career Commemoration Award is a block of crystal containing a laser etched replica of the Marshall M. Fredericks Expanding Universe sculpture. The sculpture was installed in the South Court of the Harry S. Truman Building in 1964 and symbolizes the immensity, order, and mystery of the universe. The crystal has the employee's name laser etched on it and comes with a black marble base. We would have loved to have these awards on display, but the State Department has indicated the sculpture will take six to eight months to <laughs> deliver. <laughs> At this time, we would like to invite Lieutenant General Thomas Cardin III to present Mr. Jack Dowtrick with the Defense Civilian Meritorious Service Medal. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise. Close the order. Attention to orders. The citation to accompany the award of the Chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff of the Joint Meritorious Civilian Service Award to Jack Dowtrick. Jack Dowtrick distinguished himself by exceptionally meritorious service while serving as Senior Foreign Policy Advisor to the Commander, North American Aerospace Defense Command, and United States Northern Command, Peterson Space Force Base, Colorado, from August 2021 to August 2024. During this period, Mr. Dowtrick directed a diverse and talented team of foreign service, civil service, and military employees with exceptional skill and foresight, ensuring the Department of State's global perspective and United States government global engagement on national security issues were brought to the table in support of, the, of these commands mission. Jack and his team used their unique roles to reach up, down, and across the organization helping break down stovepipes and ensure ideas and best practices were broadly shared. During Mr. Dowtrick's tenure, the foreign policy team provided <coughs> expert diplomatic and foreign policy advice related to Operation Allies Welcome, Russia's war on Ukraine, the Israel-Gaza conflict, and the ongoing pacing challenge of the People's Republic of China. The distinctive accomplishments of Jack Dowtrick culminated a 24-year distinguished career in the service of his country and reflect great credit upon himself the Department of State, and the Department of Defense. Thank you, Lieutenant General Cardin. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. <laughs> I got you. So next up is my own personal remarks. I thought I'd do a little bit of story time. So growing up, I'd always, um, you know, go visit my dad at, you know, his embassy and get to see his huge collection of coins he'd always have. And oftentimes, um, just the different embassies he'd go, he'd bring me back a coin, right? So I have quite a culmination of coins um, now at my house. Uh, you know, I still needed a display, but hopefully I'll, I'll get one at some point. And so I thought you know, what not a better opportunity than to coin my dad with a coin I got to make last semester um, in my own ROTC program. Nice. And so with that, you know, I hope to be able to give him more coins throughout the future of my career. And um, yeah, so. <laughs> Nice. Ooh, nice. 
Yes. It's got a bottle opener. It does. It does have a bottle opener. <laughs> Paul? <laughs> well, I'm 21, so. <laughs> Uh, Jack Dowtrick has received letters of congratulations and certificates from the Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, former Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, members of the Senate, and numerous ambassadors, flag officers, and State Department leaders. We invite you to view some of these on the, present ta on the presentation table after the ceremony. The table is right over there. The United States Department of State recognizes its members would not be able to succeed without the unwavering support, commitment, and understanding from their families. It is only fitting at this transition from one chapter of life to the next, we honor these individuals who played such a crucial role in their spouse's career. At this time, we would like to recognize Mr. Dautrick's wife, Lori, for her remarkable support she has given him throughout his, throughout his career, and to recognize her own dedicated service, working as a community liaison officer in embassies Asmara, Montevideo, Managua, Abu Dhabi, and Consulate General Ciudad Juarez. Mom and Santi, would you please come join Poppy on stage? <laughs> Santiago will present Mrs. Lori Dautrick with an engraved vase marking her 12 years of service to the Department of State at five separate missions. <laughs> all right. Let's see. All right. Now I'll be giving a speech for my mom. Um, the speech was written for me, so um, bear with me. But um, it's called a citation. <laughs> <laughs> all right. To Lori Leo Dautrick for her distinguished public service to the Department of State, U.S. Embassy personnel from all agencies and their families during five separate assignments as a community liaison officer between 2002 and 2021, including Embassy Asmara, Embassy Montevideo, Consul Consulate General Ciudad Juarez, Embassy Managua, and Embassy Abu Dhabi. During this period, Mrs. Dautrick's patriotism and sincere personal involvement with the, with the with the welfare of the U.S. Embassy community members and their families, both civilian and military, earned her profound respect from the community and an ambassador, sorry, an ambassador of goodwill and an example of family members. She had a significant, lasting, and positive impact on the quality of life of families. An effective advocate for embassy community exemplified the values of patriotism patriotism, citizenship, selfless service, and personal sacrifice, including during ordered and authorized departure scenarios, the, distinct, the distinctive accomplishments of Mrs. Dautrick reflect the great credit upon herself and the Department of State. Thank you, Santiago. At this time, Mrs. Dautrick will place a Department of State pin upon Mr. Dautrick's lapel. This Department of State pin will, will symbolize retiring from diplomatic service and the beginning of the next chapter in their lives. Thank you, Mom. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct honor to introduce my father, Jack Dautrick, United States Senior Foreign Service, retired. I don't want to drop that just like I dropped the mic. And I apologize in advance, I am going to fumble around with papers here to try and keep myself a little bit on, on track. Um, it's absolutely amazing, truly amazing to see so many wonderful friends, family members, and uh, esteemed colleagues here in the room. And first of all, Sol, thank you. That was amazing. That was awesome. It was really, really wonderful to have you up here. 
you know, running the show for this. So, so thank you for that. And Major General J Jenkins, Connie, um, I've, you haven't seen my remarks either. I know, I'm nervous now. <laughs> but uh, I truly appreciate you being here. Uh, you've been a great friend, you know, and an impressive colleague, and I count you as one, two, three, I think four, one of the top four jaders that I have had a, <laughs> that I have had a chance to work with. So, <laughs> thank you uh, to my team, uh, the U.S. Polad team, uh, for you know for all the help, the support that you've given me. I may uh, call a few out later, Lisa, but uh, we'll get there. Lana from Protocol, uh, I appreciate everything that she has done to help this. Dan and Sh Shakita, did she come today? Just Dan. This is terrible. <laughs> so Dan and uh, she keeps Dan at least today uh, for presentations. Thank you, uh, and then uh, Josh and Tom for uh, for you know representing from public affairs. We appreciate what you're doing. The staff here at the hub, everything uh, that has to go into putting this together. It's it's uh, a lot of work, and I appreciate uh, the support and and making this possible. Bobby Lewis, thank you, sir, for coming down from God's country. That's Buena Vista, that's Chafee County, for those who don't know, and giving us God's words and inspiration today. That was absolutely beautiful. So I've had a, an amazing career. We talked a little bit about it here. I may throw a few short stories out during this. I don't want to relive uh, or make you guys relive it uh, today. I'm happy to, to share stories by the Fireside Skiff up in Buena Vista sometime. But, uh, but it has truly been a family affair, and, and we've lived all over the world. Yeah, you know, Santi got to be in four continents in his first four months of life. Sol got to live in five countries in her first five years of life. So that just kind of set the mark as we started out this journey together. Um, you know, we've had challenging assignments. We haven't always picked, you know, the, the sort of typical cookie pusher diplomatic assignments, but we've really loved the ones that we've had and, and we've been blessed to serve in, in, in wonderful places despite hardships and enjoy, you know, enjoy the chance to serve and enjoy the chance to make a difference in those, uh, those locations. Um, but all along the way, obviously our core family has been critical in that, but our extended family, uh, everybody here, and, and I'm so lucky that with the one exception of my mother who's going to watch this uh, remotely, all of my family, my, my, my key family members are here, and that's, you know, that really is a, a special, special time, so thank you. So first I'm going to say something about my father. Uh, my dad passed away when I was 10, but the seeds of travel and adventure were planted early. And he was a true mexico -file. He spoke excellent Spanish, and he helped, or he showed me how to embrace borderland cultures. We had a place, a little Margaritaville trailer down in Mexico, and we used to travel down there all the time. And, uh, you know, it absolutely had an indelible imprint. Uh, he was posted in the Aleutian Islands in the late 1950s, and he fell in love with Alaska and the Arctic. He worked and he wrote about Arctic research on Coast Guard cutters and Ice Island research stations, so things that are directly relevant to the NORAD and NORTHCOM missions today. And it's been absolutely amazing for me to connect to his work through the Arctic activities at U R NORAD and, and U.S. NORTHCOM. So, Dad, I love you. And to my mom, to my beautiful and intrepid mother, who is not here in the audience today, but will watch the recording soon from her home in Seattle. She had a major influence on my love of international affairs and global travel. She served in the Peace Corps, a, a volunteer in 1961 in Liberia, the first Peace Corps mission to Liberia when that program was just getting started. And then she, uh, and actually she and four other women, traveled, hitchhiked for several weeks overland over the Sahara Desert. And that was a pretty, pretty crazy journey and uh, one that uh, there's a lot of information out there on. So the bottom line, she, later on she worked at the Bureau of Indian Affairs in Arizona, but she instilled a desire for adventure, for travel, and cultures, and has been a driving factor for me throughout my life. And we were fortunate to have her join us in Eritrea for several months to help take care of the kids. Again, that's drawing on those families to, to, to support. And uh, we were able to take her back to the Sahara Desert 44 years after she left it with a trip to Tunisia when she came out to visit us there. Jeanette, 
10 years of foreign service experience, or foreign service service, service in the foreign service. She, uh, something like that. <laughs> so Jeanette's my mother-in-law, Lori's mother, and she served, came, joined the foreign service a few years after us, uh, worked in Cameroon, in Jordan, Algeria, and Washington, D.C. And it's just so wonderful to have a shared love and dedication of service to our country and wonderful to share the Foreign Service experience with a dear family member, so thank you for being here. She came up from Guadalajara, Mexico. Ruben, Amalia, so that's my wonderful father-in-law, and he's sitting there wearing his trademark yellow cowboy boots. <laughs> so you'll find him afterwards, you can comment on those. Those are actually the least bright yellow ones, he has brighter. <laughs> Ruben ha sido un gran suegro. Y agradezco mucho el tiempo que hemos pasado juntos. Muy buenos recuerdos de Hermosillo, de Rancho, de Ciudad de México, de New York, de Colorado. Me has aceptado no solo como tu yerno preferido, pero como un hijo. Y tal vez un hijo preferido. ¿Quién sabe? Right, Robin? So, so Gannon and Zach. Uh, my sister Gannon, her husband Zach, they're here today. They flew down from Seattle. And, uh, you know, just a wonderful, wonderful sister and a wonderful couple they are together. Uh, just, a, you know, love being back here close, you know, close to you guys, Colorado to Seattle, but it's so much closer than most of the time. And then just an example, you know, Gannon came out uh, during training when Lori was back in D.C. and she had her one kid, maybe two kids at the time, <laughs> and two, one at the time. And uh, she came out to lend a hand, uh, you know, as family does. And uh, at another time when Lori was moving from Mexico to Seattle, uh, I was overseas. I was in Iraq at the time. Uh, Gannon went down to Mexico, or down to Arizona at least, and helped her drive up. I think the vehicle died in the desert. They had to get rid of the vehicle. They had to get a U-Haul and continue the journey on up to Seattle with two babies and, uh, and, uh, and you know, nothing else. But again, a great example of family pitching in and, and taking, care of, uh, taking care of family. Hunter, thanks for coming today. <laughs> I'm glad you made it. <laughs> Sarah, you, again, just a wonderful, beautiful couple, a great brother, a great sister-in-law. Goldie and Maisie. Hey, you guys made it. Cheers. Glad to be back in the U.S. So they all just moved back to the U.S. from New Zealand, uh, and it's wonderful to have them back here. Again, another adventurous uh, world, global traveling uh, uh, piece of the family. But what a hero, Hunter. Um, Hunter is a selfless caregiver. From our mother, to my children, and to his own family. You know, he came out to D.C. a month before Seoul was born, and I was in Africa. Lori evacuated early for the, for, the, for the birth, and just in case she came early, Hunter was there to help out and keep an eye on our, our then one-year-old, Santiago. And uh, she did come early. <laughs> I was still in Africa when Seoul was born, and uh, Hunter was there to, to help, you know, help out and give a, a helping hand, so thank you so much. You know, just one example of many. And we got to travel together in Patagonia, do some hiking, and I look forward to some more adventures like that. And Holly, Jonathan, Alex, my cousins, little cousin, not, a, not so little. Um, you yeah, know, just great to be here. They came down from Denver, and it's so nice to have family right here in, in Colorado, and that's one of the reasons that drew us back. So we are, we're, we're glad to be home. This is the hard part, Lori. Um, there aren't enough words. They really aren't, and I could not ask. Could not ask for better. <laughs> I'm just doing it to draw you in, <laughs> but I could not ask for a better partner. Um, she demonstrates every day what love is: patient, kind, genuine, a loving light. Lori has ha has been an incredible partner at home, and at the embassy, where we have sat together on five different country teams. So to have your spouse on the country team with you and work those issues and the kinds of things that we've had to do, do and the places that we've had to do them uh, is, is truly special. Um, I'm certain that embassies would recruit me so that they could hire her as the community liaison officer. I've said that before and I have no doubt it's true. Lori, you have been the bedrock and the keystone for this family. 
you've loved me unconditionally, and I could not have done this without you. So if you can come up here, I just want to... Go with your vase. <laughs> Santiago, you're an amazing son, um, and I envy you deeply. The things that you have accomplished already in school, some of that with Bobby Lewis here, uh, in your relationships, and as an outdoorsman. You know, you are a deep thinker, you're globally minded, and thoughtful to everybody you come in contact with. Truly, truly thoughtful. You're a fine young man, and somebody I look up to. So I just wanted to give you a small token, if you can come up here. Flowers, because we are equal opportunity. And Sol. Cadet Colonel Dautrick, you're an extraordinary leader uh, and simply an extraordinary human, I'm using your terms now. You will be, without a doubt, an extraordinary Air Force officer. And I love the things we share. I love the languages, cultures of international politics. You're, uh, she's got four languages already. I've only had three, so, so uh, she's, she's, and she's got you know, more upward potential. And I'm thrilled to watch you navigate your career. I'll be thrilled to watch you as you navigate your career. And I'm inspired by your sense of service and giving to our country. So if you can come up here. Your bouquet is bigger than Santi's. So I have dear friends here tonight, um, Tim Orr. We've been together since the start, and there's no one I could count on more than you for anything. So we were, we were usually a long way apart, but I'm so glad that we were able to raise our families at the same time, have them know each other during visits. And uh, really a con big congratulations to you and Amanda for now being the proud parents of a new sailor. So please pass. My regards to seaman recruit Carly Orr, who's uh, out there starting her, her uh, job at, Fort, Fort, at Bethesda, right? At, or at uh, Walter Reed soon. She's going to be assigned at Walter Reed. Tina Street, Edgar Lewin, you guys made it? <laughs> he had to crash through the security gates, apparently, but uh, they came in a little bit late. <laughs> Two great Americans who have dedicated their lives to the service of our country. And thank you both of you, thanks to both of you for coming today. Uh, the, they have really made the transition to Buena Vista extremely easy, so thank you. We've got friends from church, both here in Colorado Springs as well as Buena Vista. Uh, so glad to have all of you join us and uh, really appreciate your support today. I think Dino came? He's in the back. I'm going to give you a special shout out just because we got to uh, learn a lot together, wargaming. And I got to play POTUS, the president. Dino would rep emulate the four-star commander. He would be, you know, the commander of our commands and making those decisions. And I, and I learned a lot in the process. But now I get to congratulate him because he has recently been promoted to chairman in those war games in his new role. <laughs> I'm going to dive back into my career just a little bit. Shout-outs for a few folks. But again, I'm, I'm hopefully going to keep this short enough that you can get to the buffet line, get to the bar. Uh, sir, you can get back to the office. <laughs> so, I didn't say thank you to you at the beginning, did I? Well, <laughs> so, sorry about that, sir. It's, it's in the notes. <laughs> so it's the deputy commander. I mean, this is, this is special. Um, so I started out, first a, a shout out to colleagues from my first post, uh, Eritrea, which is my first boss, I think one of the very first in the first month's boss in the Foreign Service, David Katz, he's here, and Ilya Levin. Uh, public affairs officer again in that first posting. Uh, it's so wonderful 
to have you come here and make the make the effort and, and represent as state state department employees uh, in this affair now david would have been the first to suffer through training a new officer uh, how to think and how to write like a foreign service officer and it's a very specific process so i hate to think about the editing and re re redirection my reporting would have caused and needed from him but uh, I, I appreciate his forbearance i do remember that a few of those reports generated unique Washington interest, like the time that Muammar Gaddafi made a state visit to Eritrea, and he brought a caravan of 200 land cruisers, drove up from the southern tip, and uh, made a trek across the country and finished with the state dinner there in the capital. Now, I was there. He was staying in a tent, as Muammar Gaddafi would do so, at the Five Star Hotel, in the grounds of the Five Star Hotel at the capital. And I almost almost convinced his security team to let a pair of German diplomats go up and have a close-up look at that tent. And they were right on the edge, right at the beginning, when uh, the, the, the supervisor, the security supervisor stepped in and, and shooed them away. I wasn't going to do it myself because I'm an American diplomat, couldn't have contact, but I uh, figured the Germans were worth it. Um, David and his partner drove down from Seattle. Apparently a harrowing trip, at least in the last 24 hours with the rain, but thank you, sir. For, uh, for making the effort and for coming down here. Now, Ilya, Ilya and I used to enjoy, although enjoy may be uh, the wrong word for these, but we used to have dinners with Eritrea's notorious Minister of Interior and self-proclaimed Vice President, <laughs> Naizgi Kiflu. Now, Naizgi only called himself the Vice President when he was nowhere near the President or anybody else that could hear him, <laughs> only us. Now, Naizgi was trained in Russia and he loved vodka. So Ilya, who would have guessed, also loves vodka and made his own infusions. And as the nights would progress, Naizgi would get wired, he would turn mean, and politics would devolve into personal attacks, which we all call in the business diplomatic posturing. <laughs> so Naizgi would threaten to have his agents strip down our vehicles at night, break into our houses, or take other gra on actions. We're sitting in his dining room, by the way. <laughs> the kind of things that undoubtedly he learned in Russia. So I couldn't keep up with Naizgi or Ily on the vodka front, but as a dutiful political officer, I tried to capture Naizgi's comments and shed insight on his state of mind. Um, thank you guys for coming down, and I, I really appreciate that. I moved from one of the smallest embassies in Asmara to the biggest and the most high profile at that time in Baghdad for my second posting, um, and got a chance to work for Ambassador John Negroponte. A true, amazing privilege to work with a titan among diplomats, somebody who has four-time ambassador, you know, deputy uh, secretary of state, and then uh, and then uh, deputy or national security, the first uh, DNI, the first director of national intelligence. Our, you know, we used to eat lunch at the DFAC a couple of times a week. Just he and I would sit down. Sometimes one of the other senior leaders would join, and he would share insights, and he would reminisce, and he would talk about his days in Vietnam a whole career earlier than that and explain and talk about what was happening there and it was sort of a cathartic thing as he was dealing with what we were what we were facing in Iraq but a true true honor to work for somebody of that caliber after Iraq I went to Jordan Amman and and uh, learned from some of the best in the business David Hale Daniel Rubenstein David Green Chris Hensel uh, they're not with us today, but I, th I think they're going to tune in and hopefully watch later on and, uh, and, and true, true role models, each one of them. Now, Ambassador David Hale, he went on. He was there in Jordan. He went on to be Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, and he's now at the Wilson Center. Now, he was not married, and he wasn't much of a children guy. So when the threat against me came up, which I think General Jenkins alluded to, uh, my family was immediately cordoned on to the embassy grounds and we stayed at the Chiefs of Chief of Missions residence for two nights. Now, as we stayed there, we were negotiating with Washington for a beneficial onward assignment. I needed a soft landing to, to make up for the trauma we were under, undergoing. Um, and so to keep the pressure up, I told Santi and Sol to run around the Chief of Missions residence and touch everything. <laughs> the artwork, the sculptures, you name it. And they did, uh, but David Hale was incredibly patient and supportive. And, David, and Ambassador Hale and Ambassador Negroponte and others made sure that I could land in a, in a safe, upstretch assignment uh, in idyllic Uruguay, uh, which was one of the few non-hardship posts that my family got to enjoy. So speaking of Uruguay, Scott Roberts, I see him out there. 
So Scott, I really appreciate you coming down from your, uh, what do you call it, a compound in the Bitterroot Valley? Uh, Scott, I got to work with Scott in Uruguay. He's a J former J5 Niner here and uh, now retired Lieutenant Colonel. Is that right? Very, very retired, actually. Well, he's still, he's still doing some pretty cool stuff. But uh, he's got kind of a rugged Montana personality, but I have it on good, good inside information that when he's sitting out on the deck enjoying a beverage, he regularly wears the T-shirt I gave him at his retirement. <laughs> hey, Scott, what did that T-shirt say? I love diplomats, <laughs> and it's bright green, which is probably why I didn't wear it today. But uh, but I know I know he loves it. I know he cherishes it. Work in progress. <laughs> um, Israel Palestinian affairs. I got to work back there in Washington D.C. It was the ultimate hardship assignment when I spent two years in D.C. working on those issues. Uh, David Cottle's here tonight. Uh, he knows well what that was like. But I'll get back to David here in a minute. So Embassy Tunis. You mentioned that as well, General Jenkins. Uh, I was assigned to Tunis as an upstretch assignment to a sleepy, family-friendly NEA Middle East post. I was looking forward to that. It was going to be a nice reprieve. Had a, uh, Lori had a great, well-paying teaching job. The kids had a great school. I mean, top, top level. And we had the best non-ambassadorial residence in the region. A true mansion on the Mediterranean. Just a gorgeous place. We were looking forward to three years. But six weeks after the family arrived, an Islamist mob sacked and burned the embassy and uh, destroyed the, uh, the, the, the wi my wife's and kids' school. So I'm not going to dwell on that uh, terrorist attack in, in Embassy Tunis. Uh, there were a lot of lessons learned that day, but I really do want to give a shout out to one of my A100 classmates. She came in with me, Lucia Payazza, who was one of the heroes that day, an incredible Marine detachment military team and the regional security office. Uh, we were blessed by great leadership, Ambassador Wallace and Natalie Brown, the DCM. And uh, it was, you know, it was, it was quite an affair. But after things settled down in Tunis, SDO DAT, Colonel John Cher and I, we would go cycling. And we, you know, the city got normal. We were still traumatized. Our embassy had been, you know, almost, almost taken to its knees. But we'd go cycling a few, few months after that, and we'd go through some of the suburbs of Tunis, more uh, Islamist, you know, poorer areas, knowing that some of the very same people we were riding by, watching us go by, had probably been crashing on our embassy doors and torching, torching the chancery just a few months earlier. Now, back to David. And this again, this is, you know, people coming to people, colleagues coming to colleagues. You know, when the family was pulled out of Tunis, he and another colleague, Chris Hattire, you know, they took Santi, Santi, out to a baseball game. Wanted to make sure he felt good, that he was okay. And, uh, you know, I couldn't do that. And so I just, you know, I appreciate that support. You know, small gesture, but, uh, but a very important one. So thank you, sir. Ciudad Juarez, uh, great posting. Not quite as sunny and uh, gleeful as, as the general described, but uh, Ciudad Juarez, guys, like you guys, she said Mexico, it's Ciudad Juarez. <laughs> But uh, it truly was one of our best posts, and perhaps our best post out of, out of the entire career. And it just fit the family well, and, and we really did have a great time. And I had wonderful colleagues, Ian Brownlee, Eric Cohan, uh, they are also going to watch here. David, or Devin Cahill and Ard, her, her Dutch super cyclist uh, uh, husband, just a whole lot of others, a great cadre down there, and, uh, and really loved serving on borderland issues. We had a great team in Nicaragua, which came after that. Ambassador Doe, another amazing leader and mentor, and somebody who served as a Paulad for the Army Chief of Staff. Uh, she was our chief of mission in Nicaragua when the Ortega regime started to kill peaceful protesters in the streets. And once again, the family had to leave. Uh, but I was fortunate enough to have great teammates as we worked under and shelter, under sheltered in place conditions for several weeks after, uh, after they departed. John Meacham is not here today. I think he is he's a, another f J, former J5 Niner, but uh, he is training this week to start as a high school teacher, uh, which is kind of neat, and uh, look forward to, to, to circling back with him. But he's a true friend, a valued colleague, and one of the best military deputy Paulads ever, so I've been told. Not, not, doesn't, doesn't outshine you, but the, the Army Paulads really do represent. 
in, uh, in Nicaragua, an incredible, de incredibly dedicated local staff team. I haven't mentioned local staff in the other embassies. They've been absolutely uh, essential all the way through, but uh, have to give a shout out to Tammy, to Gloria, to Jordi, and many others. And they faced the same challenges and the fa same threats as the American officers, but they did so without diplomatic protection. And they truly are, you know, heroes in our business. Abu Dhabi, the last post before here, and that means that this may be wrapping up soon. <laughs> Got to work with Ambassador Steve Bondi, an absolute rock star of a charge and, and deputy chief of mission. And he's now ambassador to Bahrain. Now, now Steve, Ambassador Bondi, he was a former JSOC Paulad, and he pushed me hard to go to JSOC. He really wanted me to go to JSOC. But uh, General Van Herc picked me. Uh, Colorado was calling. And uh, as much as JSOC would have been an adventure and I really would have enjoyed it, this has been a great place to land. Now, Jim and Robin Lovewell, you guys have been, we worked with them in Abu Dhabi, and uh, uh, you've been our transition coaches and cheerleaders. Uh, having served together in Abu Dhabi, Jim was at the military, he was in the, the, the deputy uh, of security cooperation, and uh, he came back here and did some, some important work at Spacecom before retiring, and now he's a, a big wig in the, the, uh, in the uh, Colorado Springs establishment and airport management. But, uh, you know, we got also got to get to raise two of the best Air Force cadets at Colorado State uh, in very close contemporaneousness. His son was a, a year or two ahead of Seoul and is now commissioned and out uh, serving in Japan. So uh, it's fun to compare notes and be able to, to, to have that, uh, that connection. And thank you for the support and encouragement and your friendship. And finally, the women and men at NORAD and NORTHCOM. And it is uh, impressive to see as many as have come here. Clearly, the commander is out of town because <laughs> they wouldn't be here now. They'd be working. Uh, and I have it on good, good uh, report that some in the TAP program are going to come over once they start serving alcohol. So, uh, you know, they're, they're smart. And, uh, you know, the Paulad team that I work with, uh, really just a great team, first and foremost. You know, an absolute pleasure to work with exceptional people doing exceptional work. Kind of a, a duck out of water in the command, but I think we, we, we find a way to do, to do a good job. Lisa DeVault, I really, really, really want to call her on stage. <laughs> but I'm not because she's shy. Um, but it is, you know, been, she's going to retire actually in a few months, which is going to be a huge loss for this command. But I've been blessed to have these three years with her. She has an incredible amount of experience. She is a wonderful, wonderful person. She's married to a wonderful guy. And uh, you know, just, you know, just somebody who I, I cherish and, and look forward to staying in touch with. Uh, and, and thank you for everything you've done, Lisa. I'm gonna skip real quick, but I'm gonna mention Admiral Robertson and General Davis. Uh, according to the State Department, I have no direct authority over your Paul ads. But Lord knows they needed guidance. So, <laughs> so I hope you continue to put them through the paces and extract as much value added from our State Department colleagues as you possibly can. Andrea uh, Doyle, Brian Hall, and, uh, and Holly Pierce before them. Uh, they've been outstanding Foreign Service colleagues to work alongside as I finish up my career. I really appreciated working with all of you, so thank you. I mean, just a great, great team, great people, great, great friends, great, great camaraderie. And uh, thank you for making my job easier and more fun. And for making me look good. Brent, Major Whitehead, deeply appreciate the opportunity to work with you. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, I just, you know, hard work, dedication. This man, he's, uh, he's, he's, uh, he's an inspiration. And I look forward to seeing where you go next and how you apply those FAO skills, the foreign area officer skills. He's going to go overseas and work in an embassy environment and uh, take everything he's learned uh, and all the things not to do and uh, carry that with him. So finally, uh, I'm deeply appreciative of the opportunity to work for two incredible and inspiring commanders here at NORAD and NORTHCOM. The leadership, uh, the insightfulness, the clarity of thought that they both embody was absolutely inspirational. General Van Herc, I know you'll watch this virtually. Thank you, sir, for letting me serve at NORAD and NORTHCOM. He hired me. I learned so much working for you, working with you, and watching you lead. You and Marilyn are always welcome back to our home. And General Guillaume, likewise, 
I have appreciated the opportunity to work for you these past several months and am very satisfied to see you, your strong vision, your purposeful actions, and the direction you are taking these commands. So everyone in this room is special to me and my family. And I am deeply, deeply touched that you would come here and share, take the time, travel long distances, and uh, come to celebrate with me and to help honor my family. Lori and I aren't going too far. We're just up the road in Buena Vista. And I hope that many of you will drop in. If you're in this room, it's because I care about you and you are absolutely invited to my place anytime. Uh, we'll sit on the deck, we'll share a beverage, and tell tall tales about this extraordinary command and the mission we all serve. Thank you all. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. At this time, I'll present a flag flown over the headquarters of NORAD and U.S. NORTHCOM. For more than 200 years, the American flag has been the symbol of our nation's unity, as well as a source of pride and inspiration for millions of citizens. Traditionally a symbol of liberty, the American flag has carried the message of freedom and inspired Americans both at home and abroad. Today, our flag flies on constellations of satellites that circle our globe and at embassies, consulates, and military posts across the world. It flies in, in the heart of every Foreign Service member who serves our great nation. The sun never sets on the U.S. Foreign Service, nor on the flag we so proudly cherish. The United States flag represents who we are. It stands for the freedom we all share and the pride and patriotism we feel for our country. We cherish its legacy as a beacon of hope to one and all Long mate wave. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise as Bobby Lewis comes forward and delivers the benediction. Jack, a closing prayer for you from Isaiah. For you shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break before you into singing. And all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. And a benediction, a prayer for all today, for all of you here. The Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you. Amen. Thank you again, Bobby. The men and women of NORAD and U.S. NORTHCOM and the Department of State are proud to have served with Jack Dowtrick and wish him and his family every success in their endeavors. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our ceremony. On behalf of Jack and his family, thank you for attending. Please join in congratulating the Dowtrix. The receiving line will form at the front of the stage. Additionally, Jack and Lori would like to invite you to stay for the reception. The buffet line and bar are open, and as we close, we will play a retirement theme song for Jack Dowtrick, Bird Song in the Pines, <laughs> produced using AI, and inspired by his lovely colleagues in the Paulette office. <laughs> Stories
never told Cabin in the silence Away from the cold Eyes to the sky With the birds who soar Watching wings of freedom Are forevermore